Um, I'm Jesse Tom. I'll be moderating today. And I'm going to go ahead and get started by introducing um, our panelists today. So first up, we have um, Sandra Santiago. Um, Sandra has three works published with Bold Strokes Books. He enjoys walking the dog and reading. When he isn't writing, he works as an uh, economic analyst. More interesting, though, is uh, the dog is named Spock. Um, so Sander, if you had to read only one book for the rest of your life, what would you choose? I feel like, um, A, that sounds terrifying, but also uh, I, am, I tend to have certain books I read annually, um, and I call them holiday books. Everyone disagrees with me. Um, so my uh, Thanksgiving book that I read almost every November is Misery by Stephen King. So I would probably pick that one um, and just I've read it so often and so much, and I have every intentions of continuing to read it. So we'll go with that. <laughs> That's a bold choice. I like it. <laughs> All right. Um, Rad has written 60 plus romances um, in multiple genres. Um, 2021 was the 20th anniversary of the publication of her first novel, uh, Safe Harbor, and also the year she passed the 1 million uh, copies sold landmark. She's also the publisher of Bold Strokes book, uh, Books, and I think the one that we all aspire to be someday. Um, all right, one book that you can read for the rest of your life. Well, I actually chose uh, one by George R.R. R. Martin, The Winds of Winter, which he hasn't finished yet because it's going to take him the rest of my life to write it, so I figured it was a safe choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, okay, C.J. Birch is a dog lover with a cat problem. Uh, she writes about lesbians in space and time travel and would love more than anything to see how it all turns out in the end. Um, Between Takes is her seventh novel, and she's currently finding imaginative ways to procrastinate writing her eighth. So CJ, uh, what would be your choice for one book? So I'm picking Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the one that includes all the books. So technically it's five books. So I feel like that would get me, it would take a while because it's like this thick. So yeah, I like I like the way you got around the one book. Yeah, I think that's cheating. Yeah, <laughs> I have it in one book, so technically, <laughs> you just have to find it published in the correct way, and then you're good, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Morgan Lee Miller is a daydreamer by day, a procrastinator by night, and somewhere in between, she attempts to write. When she's not doing any of these things, she's begging her feline children for attention, eating spicy food, uh, and that makes her cry. And currently embracing her documentary movie face. She has just released her sixth novel with Bold Strokes Books and is currently writing her seventh. And what about a book for you? Um, so this is hard, obviously. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat and say if I were to do a basic queer girl book answer, that's not too exciting. I would say Evelyn Hugo. Um, but if I want to be a slightly more original and go non-mainstream, I'm going to have to say Strawberry Summer by Melissa Braden because it was my first and it's the best and I can't get over it still, so that'll be it. I, I'm leaning more towards Melissa the Braden because Strawberry Summer. Yeah, you can't go wrong with either of those. No, choices. you can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and last but not least, uh, Kimberly Cooper Griffin, a Forward Book of the Year award winner, is the writer of several contemporary romance novels. Her stories explore the complexities of building uh, relationships and finding balance when life has a tendency to make things messy. Along the way, she's not afraid to tackle sensitive issues while marching toward those romantic and often steamy happy endings. Kimberly publishes with Bold Strokes Books and lives in Denver, Colorado with her wife and daughters, where they enjoy the outdoors and hanging out with friends and families. And your book. Well, I really had a hard time because I could not, I wanted to pick a sapphic book. I really did because I love them all, but so many of my friends uh, write them that I feel like I would... Um, somebody's feelings so I'm going to go with Michael Cunningham's The Hours because it has components of so many different things I love it's it's got queer characters it's got deep meaningful things um it's got uh uh things to talk about uh from uh Virginia Woolf uh and uh you know it's it's just it just hits every every button for me so I'm going to go with The Hours Nice. I feel like we got a little taste into everybody's personality here with the books that they choose. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to dive right in um, with Reboot and uh, the topic of our panel. And the first question that I'm going to ask is what Reboot means to you? Um, does a character have to go through a huge dramatic life-altering change and turning point, or can it be a more subtle? And how do you interpret that? So Sandra, I'm going to start with you. Oh, okay. Uh, reboot to me is um, sort of both of those. I feel like 
people um, in in their lives, like real people have big moments and have small moments. And so I feel like for a character, um, uh, there's a little bit of those. And I feel like it maybe also depends a little bit on the character and, and what needs to be bigger for them to sort of get the picture or if there's if they're able to kind of roll with the punches as they go and i feel like i've had both um written both types so reboot to me is just a uh, a reframing of reality sometimes um it's they were saying things one way and then something shifts and now they see something different so well, it's reboot all right and rad how about you Oh, I take it pretty literally, I think. I think for me, it, it it means a change in direction and very often a change in uh, motivation, maybe. And I, I felt kind of lucky that in the particular book I had just written that I've actually done that. But I think the, the, the critical part for me is change, either a 90 degree turn or an emerging awareness of something that in the past seemed unimportant, which now seems very important. Yeah, I think that that often is a good driver of conflict. Um, all right, CJ, what about you? Uh, for me, I, I interpreted it more as like an epiphany moment. Like it's like this big shattering uh, but I, I tend to like the smaller moments. I, I tend to write that way too, because I feel like as humans, we are the sum of our experiences. And I like to write my characters that way. So it's like little tiny pieces that add to a bigger picture. So it's not always a bang moment for me. It's more of a one thing after another and after another leads to. Um, a sort of shift in perspective. I like that already we have different definitions of, of reboot and what it could mean. Uh, Morgan, what about you? Um, I am was thinking epiphany too. It was like this big epiphany, um, a shift in their belief system, um, I guess. So I, I do like the smaller moments. I kind of like the domino effect because obviously we're not going to wake up one day and boom, our whole life is totally uh, different, but um, I do think that there needs to be, I guess, a pretty big change. And I guess it, it's kind of relative depending on the character. Maybe the character has this one goal in the beginning of the book and it's not this drastic term, but for that character, it's a whole reframe of their beliefs. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I think that you can do a lot of small moments that eventually lead to this change or like one big change. Um, so yeah. Great. And Kimberly, what about you? Um, I, I take it quite literally coming from a technical background, a reboot is turning something off and then turning it back on and you've just changed everything. So um, rebooting is, uh, to me, it's a, it's a major shift uh, from one way of seeing things to another, but it doesn't always have to happen in such a drastic thing. You don't have to turn off to get there. Sometimes um, you can just see the light or uh, something matters to you so much and you take that away from somebody, um, they're going to, they're going to, it's going to change their entire perspective on everything. So um, in my books, most of them have been um, pretty major reboots, but there have been some subtle ones that made a big difference. So. All right, this next one, I'm going to start with Rad. Um, how does writing conflict driven by um, a reboot compare with um, creating conflict in another way? Um, is it easier? Is it harder? Well, I'll back up a little bit and, and just sort of like speak to what everybody else has been saying. I don't view reboot this as the resolution of conflict or the epiphany that happens at the end of a book. Like I write romance, that's all I write. And in every romance, there's gonna be an epiphany. There's gonna be a moment when the character realizes that what they previously believed about themselves, about the world, is not what they currently believe and that way, what they want to believe going forward. So it's a major turning point for them. Um, and that's in every single book I write because that's kind of the one of the critical turning points in a romance, right? We all know that. We all write to that moment at the, you know, 80%, 90% point in the book. For me, a reboot comes earlier in the work. It's one of the earlier 
turning points in the story so that it it may be a driver if it actually is in the book that you're writing and it may not be there at all i mean for me the book that i'm going to talk about tonight the the character seeks a change in their circumstances because something traumatic has happened so that in this case the reboot drives you know the character development but in general it really doesn't until the very end of the book so i don't know if if that answers your question or not, but I really think it depends on what the conflict is for the character and at what point they're going to become aware of the change that has occurred in their life. No, nope, that's great. <laughs> um, okay, that's great. I think that makes a lot of sense that depending on how the when and how the reboot happens, that there's um it really drives the the conflict and could be different for each book. Um what about you, CJ? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I have a dog trying to get into my office. <laughs> I know <are> upstairs. <laughs> if yep, we look no problem. upstairs, they would eat the couch, sadly. Ah, uh, yes. Um, how does writing conflict driven by a re reboot compared to other avenues um, of creating conflict? Is it easier, is it harder? Um, I actually, so going by my current story and going by Rad's definition, actually my, Main, one of my main characters, Simone, uh, decides to move away from Montreal and leave like all this family drama behind and start fresh in a new city. And so in that way, I wouldn't have a novel without that reboot, but also it really does drive almost her entire motivation throughout the whole story. And it, it I actually it helped with writing the story because it was very clear from the beginning like this is who she was based on she just didn't want to deal with her family stuff anymore and so it did make it easier to write the rest of her character especially yeah so that was set up right from the beginning that's yeah it's literally nice. in the second chapter so <laughs> <laughs> that does lay it out um Morgan what about you I'm gonna to have to ask you to repeat the question again. Okay, Sorry. that's okay. Your dog trying to get into? <laughs> yeah, my cats are actually like seriously calling out the door, but yeah. <laughs> it's the pet hour, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so how does dry, how does writing conflict driven by a reboot um, compare to, drive it to writing conflict driven by another source? Is it easier, is it harder? I think for me, it's a bit easier. Um, I'm just gonna talk about my current book, The Huge yep. Me and You. Um, it's pretty evident for my long character, Arlette, that she is seeking out this reboot. She is stuck in a job that she doesn't like. She's stuck in a relationship that's sparkless. And so the problem's like presented right there. And she's trying to find a way to reboot while not just disappointing her parents. Because her parents want her life one way, she doesn't want it. Um, so it kind of just sets up for this easy reboot when you just throw in a bunch of, you know, little bumps along the way. So for this particular story, it was easy for me, but I think there are other, there are other stories that I wrote that the reboot was a bit of a challenge. Um, and somehow I figured it out, but for this current book, it was, it was pretty easy for me and I'm kind of grateful for that. Uh, and Kimberly. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> I think I think the story is it. It really matters to the story itself. But um, luckily for me, the one my my book that's coming out, uh, Tides of Love, uh, my characters are actually on two sides of it. They both have things that they need to resolve at the beginning. But one literally starts off as a reboot. She's getting a divorce, and she comes from a wealthy um, background, and uh, she actually thinks she's straight at the time, and uh, uh, so she's going to have to figure out her entire life um, coming from that part, point. So there's a huge reboot for her in the very beginning of the book. And uh, the, the other character is uh, doing her life and has been doing it for four or five years, doesn't see an end in sight. And their reboot comes off later on in, in, the, in the book when they decide that they want to change what's going on with their life. And it has nothing to do with each other, but they help each other through it. And that's it, it, this book actually was so easy to write just because the two were so in two, they were they were in two different places, but they had to get to the same place at the end. And so uh, it naturally was an easy, easy uh, thing to do. 
from both perspectives. Um, I've had um, other books where I start a book off with a plane crash. That's a huge reboot, um, that kind of thing. So, um, and that was a little bit more difficult to end. <laughs> so um, there you go. Um, I, I, I think it really depends on the story, but in this book that's coming out is, uh, it was super easy. I'm glad to hear that the process was easy. I know that's not always true. <laughs> yeah. Sandra, what about you? Um, I think for me, uh, so two of my three novels have a uh, dual perspective. So you get two characters at the same time and they reboot at different stages. Um, and I think it's interesting because I think uh, their efforts can cause conflict as easily as it can resolve some conflict. So sometimes it's about challenging um, or being challenged in a way that changes your thinking for the better. Um, sometimes your reboot is well-intentioned, but chaotic for everyone else. And then I, I was trying to think about this in like the context of conflict coming from a different place. And in my second novel, there's a lot of uh, external drivers. So dealing with work, being um, like having a job you didn't necessarily sign up for. And I think that for me, it's always hard to write conflict. I'm generally non-confrontational as a person. Uh, so anytime somebody disagrees, I'm like, can we all just get along? <laughs> so I think that the reboots help. It gives me more of an intention with the character and perspective on something that's changing in their life. And so I like go through character development with, with characters as opposed to some of that external conflict um, that... I'm like, we could just solve this if I just didn't write it. <laughs> and then nobody would be in trouble. So it's it's a little bit hard. <laughs> not not creating conflict in your books to avoid conflict is a challenge, I think, for, for a romance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, there are a couple of audience questions, but before I get to those, I want to ask you um, about a book in, one of, in which one of your characters goes through a reboot, which some of you have talked about. So if you've talked about it and you don't want to get more in depth, then just tell us about that book because we want to hear about what's coming out or a book that you really love. Um, so I want to hear about the reboots that are in your book or what you have coming out or it was just released. Um, so let's start um, Let's start with Morgan. I already kind of talked about it, but- in That's the right, we want to hear more. You want to hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, in the Houston, me and you, my one character, it's a dual point of view. So I got two, two characters, but Arlette is um, from a political family, like Marilyn Kennedy family. Um, and she hates politics and everyone else in her family is political and she just despises politics, but she has grown up trying to appease her family. She's a people pleaser. And so she has found herself in her quarter life crisis stuck in this job that she doesn't want and she wants to get out of there but she doesn't really know how and so her love interest Brooke is an artist and she kind of follows the dreams not really the expectations or the money so Brooke really helps Arlette in that whole reboot process so it's you shouldn't necessarily be scared of a reboot um that's Brooke's philosophy but um yeah so Brooke kind of guides Arlette and it makes it a little bit easier for her to take life into her own hands. Very nice. Um, all right, uh, Kimberly. Um, I already brought up um, one of the characters who's going through a divorce, which is a, a pretty, you know, pretty, it's, it, it, you know, they talk about the seven major things that can happen in your life and divorce is one of them, death, you know, moving that kind of thing. Um, so that's, that's a big re reboot for her. And so she knows she's in the middle of all of this stuff. Um, but in uh, the, the other character who's been living and doing their life, they've, they've taken over a um, mobile home park from their family's business because her father's sick and she's been doing it for four years and she doesn't think that there's any way out of it. And that's how she starts the book. And so nothing's gonna change for her. And her reboot happens a little bit later on down the road when she realizes that she can make changes. It just, you know, you just sometimes don't see the, things that that can happen so when that reboot happens for her it happens kind of gradually and it kind of comes up at a time where um, there's a lot of stuff going on in her life and uh, 
and uh, she has to make some decisions. And, and one of the decision, decisions she makes is that she, she needs her own happiness and, uh, and, and the people around her giving her the advice, uh, she has to listen to them. And uh, she doesn't have to just do it all by herself. And so relying on other people is what gets her through that. But it's a very gradual reboot for, for her until she finally gets there. And she goes, oh yeah, I'm gonna quit this job that I'm doing for my family. And I'm gonna go pursue my own life. And, uh, and it makes a huge difference for her and everybody around her making that decision. I like the idea that uh, not that the reboots don't have to happen in parallel on the same timeline. That's a, you know, that's a nice idea to keep in mind. Um, Sander, why don't you tell us about, about your uh, upcoming release or just released? Yeah, so my book, uh, The Speed of Slow Changes actually releases next month. Um, it comes out in February on uh, the hardback can be available February 14th with I. I think that's just lovely. Um, and the reboot that I think is most interesting, so it follows Lucas and Alexander, and they are both married, but have decided to um, open up their relationships and pursue polyamorous relationships. And they happen upon each other at a party um, in the first chapter. And they're like, hey, I like that guy. And he's like, hey, I like you too. And then they, the, so I think that reboot, that was off screen of how do I go from living monogamously with my, they both have wives, um, monogamously with my wife to pursuing a relationship with somebody who's also in a relationship. And it's not an easy road. Like, I think it's interesting that this reboot can happen, but after, after it happens and you have this idea of like, oh, something's got to change, making those changes comes with their own sort of pitfalls. So um, both of them are freshly back on the polyamorous market and um, shenanigans ensue, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting uh, thought that whether forced or chosen, a reboot is not the end game, that after that happens, there's a whole mess to deal with. <laughs> Rad, um, what about for your uh, new release? Um, my new release is only this summer, which I'm going to read from later. And I, I wanted to take a little bit of a sidetrack before I answer your question, only to say that one of the most important things I ever learned um, was when I heard Jennifer Cruzy, who's a very um, popular and successful romance writer, say that a romance should always start with a character at a turning point. And I think that for me, that was really crystallized how I thought about starting my books and all of my characters start either right at a turning point or very quickly within the first chapter, perhaps because they're meeting the other character, there's a turning point. But I think that that turning point can be a reboot for the character. And in this particular book that I'm writing, uh, Lily Davenport is an ER that I wrote, it came out in December, is an ER doc in New York City who's emerging from the pandemic. And she is literally rebooting by going upstate to a um, environmental conservation camp for teens, and she's going to be a camp doctor for the summer and try to figure out what to do with her life. And that starts on the first page of the book. So that introduces her at the point where she is intentionally rebooting her life. And it actually has nothing to do with the romance, except for the fact that it's critical to her character development. So, oh, the other one real quick, um, which is classic for me, and I always bring it up, is the first page of Above All Honor is when Cameron Roberts is told that she's gonna be pulled off the investigative detail and put on the pr protective detail to protect the uh, daughter of the president of the United States. So that's a major reboot on the first page. And I think the closer you get it to the beginning of the book, the better you'll be. That's really good advice. I'll file that away for myself. I'm sure everyone <laughs> else is here too. <laughs> um, CJ. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in between takes, Simone has decided to uh, leave Montreal and she gets a job as an intimacy coordinator on a show in Toronto. And uh, so I introduce, um, chapter one is introducing the other character, she's chapter two. So in chapter two, you find that she's, you find her looking for apartments and it's a very different experience than what she's used to in Montreal. She's very unhappy as most people looking for apartments in Toronto are. And so she's decided to completely 
rework her life because she's um, being drawn in the middle of some family drama. Her mom is very French. She doesn't like English speakers. And her son has met a woman who doesn't really speak French well. And that's put a bee in her bonnet and it's caused such friction with the family and Simone wants none of it. So she hightails it to Toronto, a place she knows will piss her mother off even more. That sounds like a good read. Um, Morgan. I think I already answered, right? Oh, sorry, you did. <laughs> um, okay, yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna get to some, um, I'm all off my game, clearly. Um, I'm gonna get to, uh, there's two audience questions that I would like to get to. Um, so Anne Hart is asking, in a book, do you write a reboot for both main characters and then why or why not? And so I'm going to start with Kimberly on this one. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, otherwise, in, in my books, it's romance. It's about the two different characters. I almost always write from two different perspectives, but sometimes I write from one. But um, yeah, I, I think that the, the readers need to be, um, you know, taken in by both of the characters to make it a, a successful romance. So yeah, they both go through a, a, a reboot of some sort, whether or not it's a, it's, a, it's a change in perspective or it's a crisis of some sort, or it's in the very beginning, uh, like Rad was saying, that they, they, they have something that they have, you, you have to state something that they want in the, in the beginning, and then hopefully they get it at the end, or if they don't, there has to be a good reason for it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, both, both of the characters have to, and it, but it doesn't have to be the same thing. They might be coming towards two different things. And sometimes that's actually more interesting that they're looking for two different things, but they find it with each other. And uh, to me, that kind of uh, really solidifies the heart thing in the romance is uh, that somehow whatever they're looking for is, is found when they, when they find each other in that romantic ending. And you do that through a reboot with both characters. Yeah, yeah. We regardless of whether or not it's it's a subtle one with one of them or really dramatic with one, but um, yeah, they both have a a pretty good reboot. Yes, Sandra, what about you? Um, as a panster, I don't really try to <laughs> reboot anybody. Um, sometimes they need it. I feel like um, in this last novel, um, one of the characters definitely reboots a little bit harder. Um, and I'd say the other character has changes that happen, um, way, pretty, but it's all in respect to like that first decision of, of opening his marriage. So I think one character experiences something a little bit uh, more thought changing than the other, but they both go through changes. And then historically, um, I think that there have been, in my first novel, there were definitely simultaneous reboots. So I think it just, I think, um, I don't know, sometimes it happens to everybody. <laughs> sometimes sometimes a side character reboots pretty hard and you're like, whoa, bro, slow your roll. Um, and so I, I just think, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't have any plans to do anything, I guess I should say. <laughs> <laughs> so yours is a little more uh, character and novel specific. Yes. <laughs> And whatever the the moment strikes, and that's that's where you go. Okay, I, yeah, I used to be a pantser too, so I understand. <laughs> um, Rad, what about you? Well, I'm a pantser too, but um, I think that in a romance, in order to have two well developed characters that the the reader can really relate to, both of them have to change and grow during the course of the book, but. In my books, at least, it usually one it's one person's story um, that predominates. So that it, there's never in my books they're they're not totally equal stories. There's usually one driver um, of the story, and sometimes I'm surprised that who I think it's going to be it doesn't turn out to be when I start writing the book. When I started writing Safe Harbor. Um, you know, I thought sure it was Reese Conlon's story, but in fact it wasn't. Um, and it wasn't until I put the two characters together and began to see how they interacted and who really, whose strongest needs um, drove the story. But I think that in a romance, as Kimberly said really well, is that both characters change because they are involved with one another. I mean, that's the heart of a romance. 
that if it weren't that person and no other person, they would not reach the point where they have a new understanding of themselves or a change in their belief about something that they previously believed. So that the two of them together, you've got two character journeys and your romantic journey. So you have three journeys in the novel you know, one for each individual and the story of their journey together. So that's how I think about, you know, my story as I plot. Um, so the answer, the, that's a long answer to, yes, they both have a character journey and they both change at the end. <laughs> it's a good answer though, long or not. Um, I, I have to say right now that I'm glad that um, I said the right thing because uh, I didn't want to disappoint Rad. <laughs> she taught me everything I know. So <laughs> no failing grades here. We did start together, didn't we? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Kimberly was my mentee. Yes. In the writing academy. Yeah. Oh, then it is a good thing you didn't fail that question. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, <laughs> I think she probably heard that a couple of times. <laughs> Only once or 500 times. <laughs> yeah. All right, CJ, you have to follow that one up. Um, for me, it really depends on the story. Uh, my current one, Simone's is in the beginning, but Evie's, the other character, hers is at the very end, her reboot. Um, and I was thinking an intimate deception, which is uh, a murder mystery, um, only like it really is um, Elle Ashley's story. So even though it's told from the point of view of her brother, um, a reporter who she gets entangled with and herself, she's the only one really who gets a reboot. Well, I guess maybe EJ, her brother does, but mostly it's her because it's her story. Um, and then the new book that I'm currently procrastinating is um, it's kind of actually interesting because the whole story is one of the characters reboot like the whole novel is sort of her reboot because it takes place on a cruise ship so it's a an eight eight night cruise so the whole story is told in eight days and it really is like her sort of getting these moments and really reevaluating her life and then at the end the second character gets her boot, reboot but only because she's met um the other character who sort of sets her on her path i guess so to answer that question in a short answer not all of my characters get re reboots but in my newer books i'm finding more do nice eight day reevaluate and change your life that sounds like a very relaxing cruise <laughs> it's a murder mystery so oh even quiet. better it's, yeah it's not very relaxing no i'll, I'll stay <laughs> off of that cruise <laughs> all right morgan yes they both go through reboots but i think sander both sander and rad had mentioned that one character kind of has a bigger reboot than the other and i had some time of thinking about each of my stories that everyone's been talking and I definitely see that one character has a more drastic reboot and then the secondary character will have like a little like epiphany but um it's really not that big so for the Hughes and me and you the story focuses more on Arlette she has more of the drama um and she has the bigger reboot um and her love interest broke she has like a little bit of a reboot of you know they it was the second chance romance so Arlette and Brooke had a fallout um and Brooke's kind of still like you know not I wouldn't say a full-on grudge but just like what the hell uh, you have a lot of explaining to do um, so her reboot's more of like forgiveness, empathy, and understanding while Arlette's like, I need to change my life because <laughs> I'm not happy right now. So, and I, other parts or other stories, I would say one character has a bigger reboot than the other, but they both go through something. That makes sense. It sounds like everybody has characters that change in some way, but at times somebody's really the driver of that story. Um, all right. So we have another question from the audience. Um, do you have a dream character or profession you've tried to put into a book, but it's just never fit yet? Um, I'm going to start um, with Sandra on this one. I do. I am. I love sports novels. I will read pretty much anyone in any sport doing anything. And I haven't written like a, a major sport character yet. Um, I have a book contract with a bold strokes that is uh 
X Games. So they're skateboarders and rollerbladers and BMX bikers. And But like, I think at some point I'll get to write like the baseball player of my dreams or a uh, football player. Um, and I don't know why I just like, I think about them, but they just do not, they just do not come out on the page. So that's definitely one I think about a lot. <laughs> I'm here for it whenever it happens. <laughs> All right, Rad, what about you? Is there something in those 60 plus books that hasn't quite made it in yet? Well, I often think about writing um, science fiction, but it's really hard, you know? Um, and I think that it'll be so difficult to plot that I probably don't wanna try it, but that's kind of my fantasy. That's probably the one thing I haven't written that I think, you know, I would like to write if I got smarter. I think everybody would be be up for a Red Coast science fiction space opera. Uh, CJ. So actually, I feel like I already wrote my dream one because I always want, I love time travel. It's my favorite. I love movies, I love books, like I read them all. And so I always wanted to write a time travel novel and I thought about it literally for six or seven years, but nothing had really come together. And then and then I did, I had this great idea. There was this pandemic that was gonna make everybody have to live underground. And so I started writing this in October of uh, 2019. And then 20, March, 2020 rolled around. And I was like, I cannot write a book about a pandemic forcing, <laughs> forcing everyone underground. So I changed it up a little bit and it did come out. It's the edge of yesterday. So for me, it was time travel. So I feel like that was the be all and I can, I can just retire now. I'm happy. I've written the book. Right. Good. That's lucky to have gotten that in. Yeah. The, the timing with the pandemic is. It was poor. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that didn't delay the, uh, the ultimate book for you. Yeah. Um, Morgan. Um, I'm just happy because I also had a book I was trying to line up with like real time and then the pandemic happened and like ruined everything. So my third book, All the Past Few, I specifically like wanting it to come out when the 2020 Olympics are going to come out because my character is going to Tokyo and then the pandemic happened. I'm like, well, damn it, that did not work out. Um, but I, I do like CJ's answer. I do love a good time travel, but I definitely am, I can't, I can't write that. Um, I'm not smart enough, or I don't have like the understanding to like fully write that story. So, um, but I, I will dream about it. I'll dream about writing that time travel book. Um, but another one would be uh, a marine biologist. I was like one of many people <laughs> growing up who wanted to be a marine biologist, but then I took a biology class in high school. I'm like, oh no, I don't know anything about amoebas. <laughs> um, so I had to, you know, pivot from that, but like, I would love to write a story about someone who, um, is a marine biologist who works with animals. I love animals, but I just haven't really figured out what the plot of the conflict would be. So maybe I'll figure that out down the road, but yeah. Well, it seems like you maybe have a natural writing partner for your time travel space opera with Rad, so you guys should should connect here, and we'll look forward to it when it comes out. No pressure out. on me. <laughs> All right, Kimberly, what about you? Um, well, um, mine has already been thwarted. Um, it'd be something along the lines of everything, everywhere, all at once, um, but it was, was stolen from me by, uh, I'm reading it right now, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Schneier. Um, that is the kind of book that I'd like to write um, would be about something that has multiple um, realms all at once. Um, I don't know if I'm smart enough to write something like that. Um, and I always lean towards romance, no matter what it is, horror, paranormal, anything like that, it'll go straight to romance. So uh, um, I think I write what I wanna write right now. Um, and uh, but uh, if I were to go outside my my comfort zone, it'd be something along the line with multiple realities. I think. Mm, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm all into the multiverse, so I believe it. I'll read it when it comes out. I like the sound of all of these that you guys have in mind. So write them, please do. Um, all right, there's another question um, from the audience that I'm actually going to tack on to one of my questions, and this one is: Do you have a favorite trope um, to read about or write about? And I'm actually going to 
add on to that and say, what type of tropes do you think work especially well with a reboot? So a favorite of yours, and then one that works well with a reboot. And I'm gonna start with Rad on this one. Oh, okay. Well, I have probably a couple. I mean, I really obviously like the bodyguard trope in the expanded sense. I like to write about protectors um, in all forms, which is why you know I have a first responder series and the justice series and the honor series. I mean, I like to write archetypical heroic characters. Um, so the bodyguard trope in, in any form really works for me and probably half of what I've written in one form or another is someone protecting and guarding and or taking care of something or someone, the environment, another person, um, which I think doesn't necessarily require a reboot at the beginning of the book, although it requires a challenge. And that may be something external. I mean, if in, in Firestorm, for example, the challenge is the wild, you know, wildfires. So it doesn't have to be a personal reboot for that sort of trope. I think what, what comes to mind right away are second chance romances, where I think uh, a reboot in the sense that someone is stepping out of their known environment and into a new environment. And that frequently involves bringing the two characters back together who had known each other previously. So that for some reason, they're gonna end up in the same place again. So generally there's some kind of reboot and Morgan shaking her head cause you just wrote one. So I think that I, I'll see if you agree with that. I do. <laughs> All right, Rad, there's a quick question for you that I'm just going to give you a quick moment to answer, but uh, somebody wants to know just how many books you have written. <laughs> there's never, you can never ask me a question that I'm going to answer briefly because it just never <laughs> works. Um, I think I am presently on novel number 67, I think. I, I honestly not quite sure because um, I didn't count up after the last one, but um, it's probably 67 will be out in this June. All right. There you go, Regina. That's the answer for your question. Um, okay. So back to tropes. Um, CJ. Uh, so I don't necessarily have a favorite trope to write. My favorite trope to read, I think actually is um, enemies to lovers. And I did write one of those once. Um, I'm not sure how well I did it, but um, definitely my favorite to read. Uh, as for what lends itself really to a reboot, I think the um, friends to lovers or even like the um, enemies to lovers is, is a good way because they are, they go in thinking one thing and there's something happens for them to see each other in a new light. It does sort of force a reboot of their thinking for sure. Uh, Morgan, what about you? Well, my favorite to read and to write is second chance and I think second chance like Brad said it just opens up like this all have so many opportunities for a reboot um so I love a second chance and I do think friends to lovers and enemies to lovers offers a really good reboot um I don't really read enemies to lovers um that's I guess that's like one of one thing I wish I could write just throwing that in there for the other question um but uh yeah second chance romance is my favorite and I'm going to be writing more of them, and I love all the possibilities that come with um, the reboot. There's so many to pick from, just because, you know, these two characters have a past, and now they're kind of forced to change and reboot, I guess. Um, but yeah. I like that idea a lot. Um, Kimberly. Oh, it's so hard to, to say because I like so many different tropes. Um, but I, I think the one that keeps on coming up for me is, uh, you know, kind of like a, they've sworn off love. They're just not into it right then. They need to work on themselves or something traumatic has happened and they're protecting themselves or um, something along those lines. And uh, so they're kind of guarded and not in, into it. And then it just sneaks in. And uh, I like that idea where, where, you know, somebody just goes, wow you know, I didn't want it. I don't want it, but here it is. And I'm going to jump all over it. Yeah. I do like those two where 
it seems like it just comes out of nowhere for the character, even mm -hmm. though the readers obviously know that's where it's headed. What about a reboot do you think works particularly well for that? I think uh, that that is kind of a really uh, great one to do a real subtle uh, reboot. Um, but in the end, there's that transformation that's happened. In the beginning, they're like, I'm not into this, I'm not. And then at the end, the transformation is there and they kind of do this psychological reevaluation of like, oh yeah, this is what I really needed in my life uh, rather than um, now you're here, I might as well. It's, it's more along the lines of, I really needed this. So there's a, there's a reboot opportunity in there. That's great. Sander, talk to us about tropes. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I read a lot of the body art trope that Rad was talking about, um, mostly because I think that, um, I don't know, there's something just super attractive about that person who's like, stay away from my person, you know, like, um, I, in, in real life, I'd probably be like, whoa, get away from me, but <laughs> I love to read it. Um, I <laughs> haven't written one of those, and I think, I don't know how good I would be since I avoid conflict, like, I'm not the first one in a fray, so I'd have to do some soul searching. Uh, I think the ones that I like um, are friends to lovers or enemies to lovers. And I feel like I enjoy the idea of somebody having to change their mind about somebody else. Um, you know, like if you knew this person in your youth and now you know them as an adult, it's like, hey, you didn't like that before. What are you doing? You used to hate that or, oh, you like this now? And so I, I enjoy like the, the drama that comes from that. And I think it applies well, I think there's probably somebody in everybody's life who you're like, mm, I don't remember you being this way, <laughs> but now you are. And so I think that a lot, but um, yeah. All right. I like, I like hearing about all the different ways that Reboot can be incorporated into different tropes. It seems like it's a pretty universal uh, way to, to drive conflict. We just have a couple of minutes, so I want to hear about upcoming projects, what you have next, a great social media post you're, gonna, you're planning, um, you know, something that's about to be released. So Sander, let's hear what you've got coming up. Okay. Um, so like I said, Speed of Soul Changes comes out um, next month. So pre-order. Um, after that, the next book is called Head, Head Over Heel Flip. And I think it'll be sort of something um, exciting to me because I grew up uh, skateboarding adjacent. So a lot of my friends and like my little brother are all skateboarded. And there aren't enough romance novels about skateboarders. And I hope Head Over Heel Flip um, gets the crowd excited. So that's what I'm looking forward to most. That'll be 2024, so. Excellent. Red? Uh, well, only this summer, the one I talked about just came out in December. <laughs> and the next uh, book that's coming out, which I'm not quite done with yet, is Finders Keepers which is in the Rivers Community series, but I'm actually writing um, an enemies to lover sort of romance, I realized as I'm writing this. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's uh, the, new, new, the two new characters are a vet and a physician assistant at uh, the Rivers Hospital. So some of the other Rivers characters will show up and there's a new romance between two new characters. Excellent. Uh, CJ. Um, so my next book, I, it's coming out some, I probably near December. It's called Death on the Water. It's a murder mystery. It's about Claire Mills, who is an investigative journalist who's just had a near death experience on her last assignment. And so her publisher and her editor sort of have an intervention and force her to take a vacation on this cruise. And her, the person who's in the cabin next to her is found dead on the first morning of, of the cruise. And she doesn't think it's suicide like they think it is. So she decides to take it upon herself to figure out what really happened. And hilarity ensues. No, lots of death. No, just kidding. <laughs> it's a cozy mystery. So it's very tame. Cozy, deathly yeah. mystery on a cruise. Some people die in it, but I mean. It happens. It's all off screen. Yeah. So. yeah. All right, Morgan. I am working on my seventh book. I think it's going to be coming out around December. It's called The Memories of Marley Rose. And it's about a famous Broadway singer who wants to erase her painful memories. And so we go through her whole life um, 
exciting like the 60s it takes place over a really long time um and a couple chapters she starts erasing her memories and she slowly becomes an unreliable narrator um but yeah comes out i think december -ish. that sounds very good all right kimberly finish this off <laughs> I sound boring to everybody else. Um, I'm actually working on a series and Tides of Love, which is coming out next month, is uh, the first one in the series. They're all standalones, but they all take place in this uh, this uh, mobile home park called Oceana. And there's a little bit of magic in it. I um, the fact that the, the location uh, brings out uh, the best in people and uh, solves issues and, and people help each other um, get through what they need to. And of course, there's always romance. And the, the first one is Tides of Love. Um, the second one is um, Sweet Spot, which just went to the editor. And the last one is uh, Lost Harbor, uh, which is, uh, um, I'm writing right now and I'm, I'm deep into it. There's a, a nun who's in it and it's kind of, it's a, um, it's a, a reclaimed love kind of story at the end um, of it that brings uh, two former nuns back together after they were kicked out of a convent. So I'm really into that right now. All right, so we've got skateboarders, we've got nuns, we've got death, we've got vets, we've got lost memories. There's a lot to look forward to here. Um, thank you all for a wonderful panel to our audience. Thank you for the great questions. Um, there's a web sale that's happening until midnight tonight, um, Eastern time. So please check that out. Um, everyone here's books are available. Everyone who's been involved in panels all week, all weekend. Um, it's gonna be, uh, like I said, through Monday, um, I mean, sorry, through midnight tonight, uh, Eastern time. Um, I believe the link is in the chat. So please support these wonderful authors. Keep an eye out for these um, books that they were just talking about. They all sound amazing and have a great night, everyone. There's one more. Um, reading panel that starts at eight um, that's called um, Secrets and Lies. Um, the authors are Sandra Barrett, Jackie D, Say Popovich, Carson Tate, and MG Williams, and CJ will be our mod that moderator for that one. So stick around for that. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Thanks. Great, great. job. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.